Um, this is a safe space free from any kind of discrimination. We do not tolerate any hate speech or any discriminatory behavior of any kind. Um, we, um, speaking of we all the time, but who is this we? Um, this is the Center for Human Rights, um, the CHR, um, the Center for Sexualities, AIDS and Gender, the CSANG, and at the University of Pretoria in South Africa, together with the Center for Gender Studies and Feminist Futures and the Center for Conflict Studies at the Philips University in Marburg in Germany. Um, and then there are, of course, people behind the centers. Um, so with together with my wonderful colleagues, Dr. Ayo Suvunro and Dr. Justice Mezzani, um, we started the series last year. Um, and they are here somewhere in the digital space with us, but they're traveling at the moment, so they can't be um, visible at this point in time. Um, the 2023 team, uh, we added some new faces and, and people, um, and these among these are my amazing colleagues at the University of Pretoria, Naledi Mpanza, who you will hear from in a minute about the centers at the UP, um, Lanilani Banda and Simbuke um, Kumalo, Martin Yamazi from the Center for Human Rights, doing all the um, background support here and the technical support. Thank you so very much for, for doing this. Um, without you, we wouldn't have even actually be here. Um, my name is Mariel Rice. I am a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Conflict Studies and affiliated with the Center for Gender Studies and Feminist Futures. And I have sort of both hats on um, today and in this um, conversation th series where I represent both centers here. Um, the Center for Conflict Studies is an interdisciplinary institution that engages in teaching, research, and knowledge, knowledge transfer in the field of peace and conflict studies. We publicly discuss our research and engage in exchanges with different actors in the political arena and civil society, as well as, as those affected by conflicts. The Center for Gender Studies and Feminist Futures strengthens and raises the profile in women's and gender studies at the Philips University Marburg through coordinating, networking, and by consolidating interdisciplinary activities in various fields of research and teaching. Um, and at this point, I want to extend a very big thank you to my amazing colleagues at the Center for um, Gender Studies in Marburg, also because this year the Pretoria Marburg Queer Conversation Series is embedded in the Marburg Lecture Series theme D De and Reconstructing LGBTQ Plus Politics in a Post-Colonial World, with lectures taking place in person in Marburg um, and uh, those being live streamed. And um, these Pretoria Marburg Queer Conversations are part of the lecture series. With that, um, I will briefly hand over to Laledi um, and uh, to introduce the two centers at the UP. Thank you so much, Marielle. Um, my name is Naredin Panza, as Marielle has shared. Thank you to everyone who's come today. I'm just gonna be sharing a little bit about the two centers at the University of Pretoria. Like Marielle, I also wear the two hats. We are involved with both centers. So the Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria is also an internationally recognized university-based institution. We combine academic excellence and effective activism to advance human rights, particularly in Africa, but as uh, evidence with our communication with Marielle and Phillips Marburg University, we're also international. And we aim to advance human rights through education, research and advocacy. Um, and more specifically for this project, it's happening through the SOGIESC units under the Center for Human Rights. And that center or the unit really tries to challenge um, heterosexism in our society. So that's the Center for Human Rights and the Soviet units at UP. And then the Center for Sexualities, AIDS and Gender is also a research center that uses advocacy tools to challenge social justice in society. Um, in the context of its history as the first, I believe, AIDS or HIV center in South Africa, um, we now have grown to tackle issues around social and community justice, gender-based justice, institutional and social transformation, sexual diversity and sexual citizenship, um, as well as to challenge the dynamics of gender identity, race and culture. So thank you so much. We hope that you'll reach out to our websites for more information. Um, with that being said, may I hand over to Maria once more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naledi. Um, so when we started this um, series last year, um, the conversations emanate from a common interest in the work on LGBTQ plus and queer identities among the four centers. And we acknowledge that while there has been significant social, legal, 
and political progress in many African countries uh, with regards to free expression of sexual orientation and gender identity in recent times. Discrimination, physical and psychological violence is still pervasive, even in decriminalized context. Context scholars and activists in different fields concerned with queer and LGBTQ plus studies have been systematizing existing data, identifying gaps in the political, legal and social environments and proposing new models for deepening the recognition and acceptance of queer identities in Africa. Yet much knowledge remains untapped and concepts are often thought from a Western Eurocentric mainstream perspective, falling short of acknowledging the lived realities of LGBTQ plus persons in African contexts and realities. Um, the event series explores intersections of knowledge production and knowledge transfer between diverse scholarly and activist spheres and herewith tries to contribute to methodological, conceptual and normative aspects of centering LGBTQ plus rights and lived realities in the manifold um, African contexts. Um, Last year, we discussed topics such as queering coming out, colonial legacies of anti-LGBTQ plus rights, queering perspectives on power dynamics, um, and others. And you can watch last year's sessions on YouTube and on the homepage of the Center for Human Rights. And um, there are also some write-ups there that you can um, follow. This year's event series includes three sessions, uh, which are held monthly from now until June. Um, they create a space for in-depth discussions on the topics of the depiction and portrayals of LGBTQ plus persons today, where we also ask, where is the joy in this? Um, and this is today's session. Um, next month, um, we will talk about hate speech targeting LGBTQ plus persons and in June speak about parenthood, parental perceptions and struggles among LGBTQ plus individuals in this regard. Now, <laughs> without further ado, um, and sorry for the very long introduction, um, on today's session, um, which is held um, coincidentally on the 27th of April, which is Freedom Day in South Africa to those who are not based and are from South Africa. Um, this is the in 1994. This is when the first democratic election was held. And uh, we are still in the middle of International Lesbian Visibility Week. Um, so happy Lesbian um, Visibility Week from one, one lesbian to another and all those joining us um, today. Um, I am beyond excited um, for our panelists um, and for this discussion today, um, and mainly for our panelists, to be honest, um, who is Dr. Beverly Ditsi. Um, Dr. Bev is a gender non-conforming lesbian activist, award-winning filmmaker, reality TV director and writer and musician, and an absolute inspiration on so, so many levels. Um, Dr. Bev has directed and consulted in over 20 documentaries, screened nationally and internationally. The first documentary film, Simon and I from 2001, won several audience awards. Um, and for decades now, um, Dr. Bev has shifted perspectives on the agency and voices and amplified voices of black African lesbians and continues to do phenomenal, phenomenal work for the LGBTIQ plus community as a whole. Um, they are one of the founders of the gay rights organization, gay and lesbian um, organization of the Witwatersrand friend, GLOW, um, South Africa's first multiracial and political lesbian and gay rights group. Dr. Bev spoke at the United Nations Conference on Women in 1995 and was the first person to address gay and lesbian rights at the, at the United Nations. Uh, where the aim was to convince UN delegates to um, adopt resolutions recognizing sexual diversity, a revolutionary moment um, for the African LGBTIQ plus community as a whole, and I want to say for lesbians worldwide. Um, to mark the 25th anniversary of the address, um, Ditsi has put together a 55-minute documentary, Lesbians Free Everyone, um, great title, um, uh, The Beijing Perspective, and this offers an intimate and insightful behind-the-scenes look into the women who helped shape the historic, historic event in the aftermath, and along with all the documentaries um, produced, I can highly recommend this. In 2019, um, Dr. Bev was awarded an honorary doctorate from the Claremont Graduate University in California. The honorary doctorate was, a, was to acknowledge their dedication and hard work in the fight for LGBTIQ plus um, identity and equality. Um, and 
now I will, we will finally also hear from Dr. Beth. <laughs> um, and I want uh, would like you to start um, off with taking us back a little bit um, where your activism has started and how you're becoming. Um, uh, this is a very intersectional um, day, um, so to speak, uh, Freedom Day, um, uh, International Lesbian Visibility Week. Um, so maybe you can contextualize the situations, event, events which have impacted your personal, professional, and activist um, becoming. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mariel. Um, yeah. Um, I think I, I tweeted today, I'm very ambivalent about wishing South Africans a happy Freedom Day, you know, considering that um, many of us are sitting in the dark. Um, many of us have no water. Many of us are facing all kinds of violence. This little freedom that we have, that yes, we should celebrate, um, is not really as free as we'd like it to be. You know? um, but my ambivalence also is that I live in a country where I can say happy visibility, happy lesbian visibility day, without worrying that my country is going to, you know, come and get me arrested. Um, and that is also something to celebrate even while we are here. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity, Mariel, thank you for pursuing and um, asking me to be here. Thank you, Center for Human Rights, Naledi, Isabel, thank you, thank you, UP and everyone. Um, you know, you, when you ask to do things like this, you kind of have this, you know, preparation that you do and then life kind of happens. Um, so I got married last year at the age of 51. Um, I never thought that I'd, I'd be married, not because of anything. I mean, except for the fact that in my entire life, I never thought that that would even be a possibility. Um, and then finding the right person and then falling in love and being married um, was quite a thing. Um, I never thought I'd be a wife. So everywhere I go now, I say my wife this, my wife that. And sometimes I say it, you know, to instigate because I know there's normally a double take. I go, uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, you know, but also... I'm really, really excited about the prospect of the future. Um, and then at the same time, I realized that since I've been married, I've become a little bit more scared. When I was younger, it was very easy for me to put myself forward. And I put myself forward from the minute like 16, 17 year old, well, even younger, you know, you'd say, okay, so nobody wants to start this protest. I'd be like, I'm here, you know, um, nobody wants to do this speech. I'm here. I've always been that child. And now I find myself with a lot to lose. I'm, I feel like I'm now responsible because, you know, as soon as you say, who is Bev Dizzy's wife, she comes up and all of a sudden my wife is in danger. And now there's, there's, I, there's a lot more to lose. And I say that in a country that has a constitution that is that we fought for. I, I am very blessed to have been one of the people, one of many, who fought to make this constitution what it is. And here I am, feeling not safe. My timelines across different social media is filled with so much hate, so much, so much, and un, un, so much anger. Um, and it is quite scary because we think we are safe, but I remember when I was in my twenties and I wrote for um, Outright Magazine, which was a queer magazine, then was very white and very male, very gay also. And I was very lucky to have an opportunity to have a, um, to be able to have articles. And so I, remember writing about how our constitution is meaningless if people on the ground, if people who are discriminating against us don't even know that the constitution exists. And what's worse, if the victims of the discrimination and the violence have no access to the constitution. 
I was told that I'm being, you know, a fear monger, I'm exaggerating, because obviously everybody was still celebrating the fact that, you know, this is the first constitution in the world to have the word sexual orientation. Um, but I was seeing it in my own neighborhood in that people around me literally had no idea that we have a constitution that protects us. And that when there is something that's going on, whether it's, you know, a lesbian being assaulted and the police laughing at her, um, we have very little access to this wonderful constitution. Let's forward to, you know, Yudi Simelani, Sizagela Sigasa, all the lesbians that are being murdered and raped, all the gay people, all the trans folk. Fast forward to 2023, Uganda, Kenya, Ghana. It is, it is while we may have a constitution if we can't access it, it is meaningless. And now we need to reverse ideologies. We need to reverse misinformation and so much more. Um, I heard someone say it's so much harder to go against beliefs, however unsubstantiated, however um, crazy, however not rooted in any, any whether science or, or reality, even spirituality for that matter. Um, so th those are the things that have been on my mind um, today in preparation for this talk, Mariel. And um, I know you asked me to go back to the beginnings um, and where my activism started. This is supposed to be queer joy, right? Um, and here we are. I was a happy kid. <laughs> I was a really happy kid. Um, I was very lucky in that I was allowed to be myself in my home. Um, I have a musician mom who traveled all over Southern Africa, um, who, I mean, during apartheid. So of course, you know, knows and could see the differences in how people were relating to each other and, and what apartheid and repression was, was doing you know, it within our own borders. So I understood these politics, but also because my home is maternal, I also un understood the politics around gender. I was seeing how everyone re related and reacted to, to the men that would come in and out of our home. Um, and, you know, so between, you know, race and gender and the politics around them, I was always aware how we mold ourselves and shift in behavior, in relation to what was going on around us in order to keep ourselves safe. I, I, I understood that when a white policeman knocked on the door, I could see how my family's behavior changed just so that we're safe. In the same way, I could see when a violent man would walk into our home and, and how, you know. And what that means is that I did not see cowardice. I saw survival, I saw strength. I saw power when my grandma would actually walk out with a weapon and fight. And so, you know, we had neighbors around us who were also activists. I was very lucky to grow up knowing, you know, the music that we could play in the home and, the, you know, what was banned and we couldn't. That there was a guy across the road whose name we could never mention again because he'd just gone into exile and, if we mentioned him, the police would come. I, I, I was aware. And so I knew that I would end up being an activist because my question to my, my family all the time was, why, what's going on and how do we change it? And being this, this kid who was allowed to be myself, you know, meant that a lot of the time I would ask questions and I would have, really relatively truthful and honest answers. And, and that, that has always been a very, very fortunate thing. I understood that there are different types of families. My family, for example, was my grandma, my aunt, my great aunt, my mom, my little sister. And that was a family. And this family had other extended family members. And there was different families across the road who had, you know, we all, there's never just been one nuclear mother, father here as a kid. Um, and that was fine. That was never told that or shown that there was anything wrong with these different types of families until I grew up and, and, and realized, oh, wait, there's a whole dictatorship going on about how we should be. Um, 
so my and my going into political activism in my high school really came about as it, it was very natural um, being in a Catholic school right next to Regina Mundi in Soweto, which was known as a kind of a hotbed of political activity because also, you know, Bishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu would come and give talks. And when he does, there's always police and there's always, you know, tear gas and there's always all kinds of mayhem going on. Um, and so the SRC at my school was very, was right there. But then it very, quickly dawned on me that this did not suit me in the approach to the activism, but also in the machismo and the masculinity of it. And not that masculine, there's anything wrong with the masculinity, but we were literally being told that as women and girls, we had a particular role and that, that's it. There was no other role for me, except for one that is going to be of comfort to my brothers. Um, and I would like to be really not rude, but because um, <laughs> that was just always my, my reaction. I grew up in a home where I was myself. Myself meant if I needed to climb the roof to fix or clean the chimney, that's what I do. If, I, if I'm doing the lawn, that's what I'm doing. If I'm being asked to cook, that's what I'm doing. I'm not you know, I did not grow up being told, oh, you're a girl, you're supposed to do it. I mean, they tried, you know, different family members, but I was allowed to be me. And here I am saying, I am an activist. I am willing to go and do whatever it is that needs to be done. When rocks are being thrown, I'm throwing rocks. When petrol bombs are being thrown, I'm throwing. And yet here you are telling me that my role actually is to be of comfort and service did not make any sense to me. And so, you know, um, again, I, I really do believe in purpose, in one being born for certain things, because for me to come across a whole group of gay boys in my own township and in my own community, this is in the mid 80s, you know, deep inside the state of emergency. And we're walking up and down the streets being flamboyant. And then finding out that, you know, there's a guy called Simon Nkwadi, who is this activist who was in this trial called the Delmas Treason Trial. And not only is he also an activist who was very prominent in fighting against apartheid, but he also speaks about being gay and he's teaching and talking to his fellow activists about what it is to be gay. That was probably the first biggest inspiration in my life. And then of course, meeting him and understanding that our fight is not just a fight against one sort of tyranny, that there were multiple oppressions that were intersecting. And so GLOW being formed as a non-racial, non-sexist, non-discriminatory organization is how I found it. And yeah, <laughs> um, having Simon as a mentor, as a teacher, as, as yeah, that was, that was actually quite insane. And bringing it to now, I know Mariel, you wanna jump in, but bringing it to, to now where we are, I catch my breath every time I hear young queer people saying, it's not my job to teach. And I'm not saying that all gay people or lesbians or trans folk or non-binary folk or, or intersex folk, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not saying that, that all of us across this beautiful spectrum should be activists and go out and teach. But there is something really ignorant and arrogant, I'm sorry, my siblings, but it needs to be said. There's something really arrogant in wanting to think that the people who are hell-bent on killing us are the ones that are going to educate themselves about us. They have no vested interest in educating themselves about us. And so if we had done that, 
would we be where we are? Would we even have this constitution? Let me, let me tell you how Simon would teach. Simon, we, we were coming back from an overseas trip. It, I think was an, it, one of the international gay association conferences um, in the mid nineties. And we land at what was then Jan Smuts Airport, Oar Tambo International. And you know, you've got the nothing to declare and the green, you know, sorry, the red, you want to declare something. And so all of us walk towards the nothing to declare. I mean, and then you kind of hope and pray that they don't pick you because also you're tired as an overseas trip. You don't want to be undoing your suitcases um, and then finding your things. No, Simon goes straight towards the red lane. And he says, come. I say, why? He says, come. I'm like, what the hell? He opens and they're like, you know, oh, you're declaring? He's like, yeah, 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 I'm declaring all these, these wonderful things I have. And he opens a suitcase and the sex toy of all kinds from anal beads, dildos, like dental dams, and those condoms. And and I'm having a, a small little death because now I'm completely embarrassed. They are gobsmacked. I'm hearing, see, who's about me? Now, can we see this? And now security is all calling each other because what the hell is this, right? I mean, there's like handcuffs. There's like magic wands. There's, I mean, everything is in that suitcase. So I'm saying, why? And he says, well, let me tell you. And then he says, have you used a condom before? This is, under, okay, this is the mid 90s. So of course, HIV is kind of a big topic. He starts pulling out all these things and starts teaching. And they're all laughing and calling each other. And, and he's like, oh, my sister, does he have a, does, is it this? Like he is fun and funny and teaching. That's where my education comes from. We walked away from there. Actually, it was fun. I laughed a lot. They laughed a lot. And even those who were embarrassed learned something. He was talking about queerness. He was talking about HIV, safety. He was talking and like, somebody was like, but the lesbians, how do they do it? He looks at me, I'm like, I'm supposed to answer <laughs> You know, so of course I grabbed the dildo and they all go, oh, and I'm like, Hey, you know, it's not the only thing and the dental dam is there. Um, we were educating. We went on media, we were educating. It wasn't just, oh, it doesn't help that I grew up in TV, you know, being a child star with a mom who was also like the first presenter on South African television um, and actor and doing all these things. I was used to cameras, you know, the, the, this light, does not phase me. And so here I am doing all these media interviews. And, and of course the reaction is different now, right? Because it's not just, oh, that's the child star. It's, it's the <clears throat> you know, because people needed to figure out how to describe me. Um, thank you. I'm glad I'm seeing all this laughter because yeah, it was funny because I would laugh also. Um, but we were educating. And so when young people say, it's not my job to teach, the danger is this. I did a, in 2017, I did a documentary for um, a group called Kasra. Um, they were an association, a group that, that was working on human rights across the continent made up of coalition of African lesbians who don't exist now, unfortunately, made up of, you know, um, 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 sorry, what were they called? Um, th there were a few groups, I think four groups. Um, I remember it. And they were working on the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. And they were asking me to do a whole 10 years of how they actually went to the African Commission, which is a human rights arm of the African Union where you know, if your rights are being violated, that's the platform for you to go and it has all these commissioners. And the work that they did there and understanding how the religious right from the USA in particular 
have infiltrated the east of Africa and how they've done it. I was being told there were stories of a, a minister from the US sitting at a lunch with a Zambian parliamentarian writing notes on a napkin and saying, when you get to parliament, this is what you say about these homosexuals. There's a scene in the film, which I'm hoping Mariel will share. The, the film is called The Commission from Silence to Resistance, and it's very much an advocacy film, where Museveni, President Museveni says, you know, I didn't know what these people do. It's disgusting. And you wonder, what is he talking about? He says he didn't know what they do, not who they are, what they do. And then you find out that there's a, a guy who is a minister called Martin Semper, who we call, everybody called the minister of Poo Poo, who enjoyed researching and finding the kinkiest porn. And then walking around the most remote villages and the city center in churches, in town halls, showing that kink. A lot of us are into different types of kink. We all do different things um, and enjoy different ways of being. But even that one was like, ooh, 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 you know? And that's what the man was showing everywhere. And that's what gay people do according to Ugandans. If you're seeing the level of hate and disgust, they, even there's no rationale, even when you are asking, what is it about homosexuals or the LGBTI community that bothers you? There's no rational answer except for this is what they do. Nature abhors a vacuum. We know that. We grew up saying that. We, we heard this when we were children. Nature abhors a vacuum. If people don't know what's going on and somebody else fills that vacuum, that's what they will take with them and run with it. So now it's harder to undo the damage. It's harder to undo. It is near impossible to go against a belief, however ridiculous or untruthful it is. So here we are, not teaching. So how is that working out for us? Um, I see the film. Thank you for putting it up, Lesbians Free Everyone. Oh, that's, Mariel, that's the latest one. That's 2020. That's Beijing. That's fine. Um, it is 48 hours, so it is actually free to view also. I will find the link for the commission, and I will put it up as well. It's called the Commission from Silence to Resistance, and it's on YouTube. Yeah, I just added that also. Um... Yay. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Yes. So, so, I mean, you know, I, I, I cannot help but re refer back to the work that we put in and how far we have slid back. You know, um, and I don't think that one can be, you know, truthful in their activism if they don't look at what role one has played, not just in the positive, but in the negative. But then again, I do say, you know, for self that I am only a human being. And my pivoting into TV and into film was exactly as a result of realizing that a lot of the time we, don't, we are not the ones who are in charge of our narratives. And I had had enough of doing interviews um, one little story, I tried to actually find it. You can't find a lot of digital archive online in, in the country. I think apartheid did a lot of damage, but we know that. So somewhere in the nineties, like I said, I grew up around superstars. I grew up around, I mean, my mom was a superstar. So of course I grew up around people who were stars. And Brenda Farsi was one of the people who we would hang out with. We did a, quite a few TV shows. She was always there. Um, and so I did an interview for City Press and along the lines of, you know, the same kind of interviews that we are continuously doing. And Simon, you know, was one of the people who would encourage that I do these things. So we did, a, I did an interview and a few weeks later, the journalist calls me and says, do you know Brenda Fassi? I said, oh yeah, no, no, good friend. Always been a friend. She says, oh, do you hang out a lot? Yeah, 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 we hang out a lot. Sunday comes and I get a call from Brenda early in the morning home line, home telephone line, 
and she's and yelling and what happened what's going on she said go buy the city press go buy the right now and call me back so i go to the shops we could still buy newspapers young people we could buy physical paper um and the headline across the city press says brenda fassi's lesbian lover yeah so I, <laughs> who's laughing? <laughs> so, funny. so I call her back and I say, it wasn't me. She says, but babe, I'm like, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. I would never say that. I mean, besides the fact that she was 10 years older than me, besides the fact that, you know, we my Miami, she's somebody that's close. She gets advice from my mom. Like, I would never do that, but they needed a hook. It was the hook. And part of the story has something like, People peep out their windows when I walk past. Uh, people whisper about me, which obviously made it seem as though, because there was no picture of me, I must be this ogre. I must be this ugly looking thing with horns. And that was the angle. And what's really messed up about that is that once that takes hold, it's hard to undo because a general person who sees that headline walks away and does not necessarily engage and will never engage with you, the real person or the real truth. They've just taken that and they go. So there were a few kind of, you know, moments that made me realize I need to go back into TV, but this time behind the scenes because I needed to control the narrative. And that's what I started doing. And for me, that's how my activism pivoted in how, you know, the stories that are told, how and um, who tells them. And it became my life's mission to, to make sure that, you know, the kind of representation that we have makes sense. Yeah, thank you. This is a wonderful ride through, um, through the past and and coming to today as well, and thank you so much for the for the insights you're sharing and um, the the personal um, that you bring into into all of this, obviously. And um, I I, I want to pick up one of the things, um, or many of the things you said, but in order. <laughs> um, mm. And so I'm um, I'm wondering about the role of media as an educator. Um, so as an educating, as a, as a space for knowledge production, as a space for, like you said, producing narratives, producing stories, producing storylines from a, sometimes from a single story um, perspective um, and the angle that fits somebody's story or some, some mainstream story that somebody will want to perpetuate, especially about marginalized groups of people. We see this quite often, I guess. Um, um, so, and you you spoke about this a little bit, but maybe um, reiterating again. So, what is the reclaiming of this very powerful tool that the media is um, mean for you um, to display different storylines, um, portray activists in a certain kind of way? I think, I mean, the way you do this in your document documentaries, I think, is so instructive because you you focus so much on the on the power on the agency of your um, um, of, of the um, uh, <laughs> of the people of your protagonist. This was the word I'm using. Um, I'm, I'm looking for. Um, and these protagonists are often, um, specifically, I think, in the commission. This comes out, but obviously, in Simon and I, and in Lesbians Free Everyone, these are super strong um, black. LBQ women. These are super strong black um, LGBTQ plus activists um, fighting against different kinds of oppressive systems in violent, problematic spaces. Um, so how how does this tool of media um, work in a way? How do you make it work for you for for your protagonists? Um, I think I've been very fortunate to, to have this role um, and to continue to do the work that I do in that, you know, I, I walk into spaces already very much myself um, and that already begins something. Um, it, I've never been in the closet 
Mm-hmm. And so people who've been closeted generally kind of say to me, wow, how do you, how do you, how do you do this? Like on Survivor, um, I, I directed four seasons of Survivor South Africa. On Survivor, a lot of the time there would be um, 120 cis het white men on camera, on sound. Um, okay, maybe not all white, you know, some black, two or two black men. I'm thinking of a particular um, season where there were just very few black folk. And then there's no black women. And then there's me. Mm-hmm who is gender non-conforming and very much myself. Um, And navigating those spaces and and being able to navigate them in a way that, you know, you walk away with some kind of camaraderie because I've I've never been in the closet. And so I would speak of my girlfriend. I would, you know, without like, it's not a big deal. It's not a thing. And just move on. If if you have a problem, the problem is yours and you need to deal because I don't have a problem. <laughs> um, and that's always been my attitude. Um, it's not just being a director making the film that puts a person at ease and has their story told in a way that is empowering for them. It is the environment that you cultivate around you. Mm-hmm. And so on, a, on any set, and it didn't matter which set, it didn't matter whether it was Big Brother and there were two queer folk in there. Um, obviously there's cameras, so they don't know who's behind the scenes, but you cultivate a situation where the people around you are not going to, not even tone, not even slight behavior going to be discriminatory by just the environment that is cultivated. For me, that's important. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you don't get the best of a person if they're hiding. Um, and as a filmmaker, that's one of the first lessons that I learned from many of my mentors is you, know, you, you make you make your protagonist as comfortable as possible in order to get the best out of them. Um, so being able to be on sets and be myself was for me first. And then being able to when I said I'm fortunate. Um, or blessed is being in a position to choose my crew Mm -hmm. in order to be able to create those environments. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm most miserable in situations where I can't choose who I work with. And it's fine, I might need to educate sometimes by just being myself, sometimes by overtly saying something, but you know, um, a lot of the time I would prefer to have, you know, my preferred people, some of them queer, some of them not but many allies, because then that's, um, I really do believe that media has played a major role in how we see ourselves, but also how we are seen. Having been on TV as a child star and everyone thinking I was a boy and how people reacted to me and related to me when I was in a dress versus when I was in pants and having people go, I thought they were twins because there's the one who acts on TV and he's the boy. And then there's you when I'm in a dress. And sometimes I'd let it go. And then sometimes I'd say same person. And then they'd go. Um, It's very, I I, I know that I have quite a unique perspective on on the world just from those kinds of reference points because I knew how different genders, different people, and let's not forget my skin tone growing up in Soweto, understanding the political impact of being light-skinned in you know, a volatile space where I'm being treated differently in different ways. My gender being ambiguous, my race being ambiguous because I speak so to listen Zulu, listen Kosa, you know, um, and Africans, you know, um, So working as a TV practitioner and someone who is behind the scenes and creating environments where I understand all these different dynamics has put me in a very unique position to be able to tell the kinds of stories that I do, whether it is on film or on TV, um, on on, in TV. So as an example, I mean, my one of my last reality TV shows a few years ago 
um, it was very interesting that it was a very tight schedule. It was really crazy. Um, I won't mention the show um, to protect people. Um, but I realized after a while that a lot of the, the, the characters who were writing in, who wanted to be on TV, it was a love show, who were all queer. You know, some bisexuals are very strong stories, very strong, beautiful characters as of sexual people. And then I was like, oh, wait, that's like a trans person. Oh, hey, sibling. Um, and, you know, it's like there's a gay man, there's like this lesbian couple who are having a big fight and they want to be, I was like. And then I realized that actually I'm, my entire research team was queer. And, well, 90%. And I'm looking around going, oh, it, you know, because I'm just so used to just being around people and being myself. It just didn't kind of, you know. But when I saw it, I was like, oh, that's what makes the difference. Because I didn't, for the first time in my life, I didn't have, I wasn't sitting in a research meeting where I'm being presented with stories and having to ask, are there any queer people? Because generally I do, I have to ask, is there queer representation? Can we find some really nice, strong queer stories? Mm -hmm. If your research team is cishet men, and this is the only way that they relate to the world, they see a queer character and their first instinct is to dismiss. And for the first time I'm sitting in a room where I had to say, this TV show, we will get flat. And we did. You know, the exec producer said, demographically and otherwise, people will think we have an agenda. And then, of course, the broadcaster came back with, Ooh, this has never happened before. And like, everybody's afraid to say, you can't, you know? But I kind of went, wow. And then, you know, to take it even further, the first episode features a gay couple who were married for many years, beautiful looking people, very powerful, dynamic, nice characters. They're having this fight. And my editor, who's a cishet man, is sitting there. He spends the whole night editing. The next morning I walk in and we go through it. And he says to me, these people just love each other. Like, why are you shocked? It's like, Gay, big gay men, but by four in the morning, I'd forgotten that these were two men. Mm. By four in the morning, I realized that these people just love each other. Ooh. Oh, man. Yeah, sorry, I need to catch my breath because that's how I reacted. Mm. Um, and then, of course, he pressed play and showed me the love scene and how he put music to it and what he did with it. And it was one of the most beautiful love scenes I'd seen on South African television. And I gave him this hug and he's, he, he couldn't believe it. And then, of course, you know, he went home to sleep. Next day, he comes back and he says, well, not next day, a few days later, he says, I was hanging with my boys and they were talking about homosexuality. And I said, stop. These people just want to love each other. Leave them the fuck alone. Mm -hmm. I felt like I'd done my job. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's like, this is why I do what I do. So on South African television, we had generations and they had Senzo <laughs> and Jason. And it was the first time people were really watching a gay couple. And there's a part of me that was like, oh my God, what's wonderful about this is that they were not, and there's nothing wrong with gay headdresses, but the stereotype is that all headdresses, uh, I mean, all gay people, you know, are headdresses or, you know, you know, super feminine roles. No, they were not super feminine. They were two men. It was incredible to see that. Um, and what, hurts still for me is that I very rarely see me mm -hmm. a gender non-conforming lesbian or even a, a um, 
a femme lesbian or even a butch lesbian, like all the different variations of lesbian that is not associated with hypermasculinity, violence, angst, terror. Oh my God. Yeah. You know, because even today, and I don't watch too much TV anymore because I can't, um, even today, I very rarely see a representation of us. And so we continue to remain invisible and we continue to remain invisibilized. Yes. I put action on the invisibilized because somebody is literally making a decision about what they put on air about us. And a lot of the time it's not us. Even those of us who have the power to change this have to constantly be at war to be able to put any representation of us that makes any sense to us. And so we are still not really in charge of our own narratives. We are constantly told who we are. And so for me, it continues to be a fight. Yeah, and I, I think I just today or the other day I read um, how the representation of LGBTQ plus people in general in, in media and in TV productions has increased over the last years, but the representation and the showing of lesbians has actually decreased. Um, so this just goes exactly to show and underline what you just said um, and how lesbians are actually literally being invisibilized. Like you said, they're literally removed from spaces. Um, I mean, you show, I think you show this literally also in your, in, um, in your, in your documentary of, um, of the commission um, that you just explained, um, showing how African, the coalition of African lesbians was literally not tolerated in one of the main um, bodies among the AU, the African Union um, human rights structure. Um, and, um, I, and I mean, so happening in media, happening everywhere, um, particularly to women, to lesbian women, to um, trans women. Um, and I think you are very much working against this um, with, with all you, you have and you put out there um, through archiving. And, and I, I feel like this is a form of archiving that you are doing. It's a very powerful tool um, through making it visible, through making um, bodies, persons, identities um, that are marginalized visible, um, making lesbians, making LGBTQ women um, visible, putting them at the center. Um, and like what, I mean, maybe it's a, it's an obvious question, but um, what does this mean to you to, to fight this, this particular fight? And um, how do you continue to do this um, through all the challenges, the, the backlash? Um, and I mean, it's, I don't even know the backlash, the word of the backlash I find, I'm not sure if it's the right word because it's like a constant, <laughs> it's more of a constant um, um, sort of pushing against. Um, like you also said, um, how, where do you take your, um, you know, your, your energy, your, your joy to do this? Um, how? Um, I'm part of a community. I think that mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it is helpful to be a part of a community of filmmakers, of activists, of writers, um, of poets, of romantics you know, of musicians, of people who, no matter how they are treated and, and invisibilized and marginalized and ignored, they continue to do what they do. Um, it inspires me to, to see it. It inspires me to know that that's what's going on. Um, you know, you, you, were, you were mentioning Coalition of African Lesbians. The, the African Commission literally kept saying, just change your name to Coalition of African Ladies. Yes. And then okay. you can do your things in private. Why do you want to be called lesbians? Mm -hmm. And they're like, but that's the whole point. Mm -hmm. African ladies. Mm. I mean, that is so far from lesbian, it's not even funny. 
So, you know, you, you understand that the invisibilization and the erasure is, is real. And so you fight. In Lesbians Free Everyone, here's the one thing that I realized that shocked me to my core. I made a, a historic five minute speech at the Beijing conference in 1995. And over the years, have been searching to find the full video of that speech. There is a few seconds of the top that I eventually found from Reuters. There's a few seconds at the end, the most famous few seconds at the end comes from the SABC, the one, the punchline, make this a conference for all women, regardless of their sexual orientation, that bit. Mm -hmm. Nothing in between, none of the points in between, none of the really poignant things, things like, you know, when um, one of my fellow activists who I, I love and adore, um, how she, where is it? How she said, um, Charlotte, yeah, Charlotte Bunch, no woman can claim to be truly free until she can choose to be a lesbian. I, 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 I break that down in that speech, but that doesn't exist. It doesn't exist in that speech. But that wasn't the only thing, is when I realized that the very first speech in 1975 that was done by an Australian lesbian who was a unionist who was also fighting for poor workers, that speech doesn't exist, not in video. There's some words. Um, this, is, this is the speech, so we've got the text. Thank you for posting that. I, I found the text, yeah, but not, because uh, I was video? also wondering about that. <laughs> uh, yeah. The whole video doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And this after, a full year while making the documentary, while going all over the world, it deep in the archives of the United Nations, what you will find is everybody else's speeches. You have Hillary Clinton. They even have when Winnie Mandela came and caused a ruckus at the UN Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing. They have all of that except for the speech. 1975 didn't happen. In 1980, I think was Kenya. And then 1985 was Denmark. There were a few speeches along the way. There was another major reproduction, reproduction conference that happened um, in Cairo, where a lot of lesbians stood up to speak. I struggled to find some of the speeches that I did and found them in people's own personal archive. If that is not deliberate erasure, then what is? Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, you realize that there needs to be a, a continuous belief of our non-existence. Because if there's a continuous belief of our non-existence, then we con can continue to be marginalized because we should not exist anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if you know the story about um, um, Rafiki, the Kenyan lesbian yeah. film um, yeah. by Wanui Kahiu. Um, so the film gets banned by the public, I think they call the film publications, the censorship board. Yeah. And then they enter the Oscars and then they go and they talk to the ministry and they say, come on, we have a chance to win an Oscar but we have to have a run of two weeks in this country, you know, in cinemas in order to qualify. And the ministry says, we have potential to win an Oscar. Okay, let's unban the film for the two weeks. It goes for two weeks, it is sold out. People are packing, people are watching this film. It is a fun film. I loved it. I was afraid for them because obviously we live in, a, in, in spaces where lesbians are raped and murdered and there was a scene there. Sorry, I won't spoil it. Mm -hmm. And after that two weeks run, he goes and he bans it again. So now the film is banned. 
So Wanuri, there's a story that goes, Wanuri invited one of the ministers into a cinema, just the two of them to say, if you haven't seen this film, let me show it to you. Just watch the film. Comes in, he sits down, he watches the film, enjoys the film. And then comes out and says, well, okay, so maybe you will unban it again if you change the ending. They are too happy. They look like they make it possible for lesbians to be happy. Change it. So then it, you begin to understand why we need to be constantly seen as angry, struggling, violated, where life seems unbearable. Because then it makes it look, the optics are, it is unbearable to live without a man. Yeah. It is unbearable to be a lesbian. And so, no, it will not be attractive. And so even those who are lesbians will have to hide it because it's not attractive. And that's been the motive the entire time. Mm -hmm. How do we undo that? By showing as much joy as possible. That film was, was for me, pure joy. And when, when that story came out, when I understood that that's what, you know, the minister said, I got it. I was like, yeah, yeah. And so I, I laugh a lot in my films. Um, I, 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 yeah, we laugh a lot because we are full rounded, beautiful human beings who live full rounded lives. You know, how, whatever the adversities, however we live, we, we live full lives. And that needs to continue to be out there, banned or unbanned, it doesn't matter. And what we, we do is we also push our narratives. You know, right now you have people saying things like, they're shoving this homosexuality down our throat. No, you are literally, we are living under a gender and sexual dictatorship. Our pushback is only this little bit, but we are pushing back against a literal dictatorship. We're being told who we are, what we should be, how we should be, as though heterosexuality, cisgendered heterosexuality is the be all and end all, and we know it isn't. It's never been. You know, like I said, growing up in a maternal home where everybody did everything and gender did not define me mm -hmm. or my roles mm -hmm. has really given me a whole perspective because I do not see it. Cisgendered heterosexuality is not the be all and end all, and it's not the point of reference for me. And it shouldn't be for any of us, actually, because then that's the dictatorship, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes I don't know if I'm even answering you. Um... <laughs> yes, no, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, and you're giving me the the bridges and the clues that um, that I um, that because I, I I do want to transition to the to the joy um because we 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 ask uh where is the joy today and um i actually in my notes i said um i wrote down that you actually in my observation of your documentaries um you radiate joy this is what you do i think um and your protagonists do this um and i think even if you are you know, depicting and, and portraying all these very dire situations. Um, there is so much joy in, in this. Um, how do you, how do we do this better? How do you, what is your, um, to us, <laughs> um, the rest of us out here, um, and I cannot obviously only speak for myself, but I find it sometimes very hard in this um, world that we live in right now. How do we create more joy? How do we recreate it? How, yeah, what is your um, maybe experience also? Of, yeah. Look, we, we all need, in, and this is purely my opinion, um, I feel like we really need to go into the roots of our own 
beliefs, spirituality, whatever it is that is that we believe as our highest self, as our higher power. Um, you know, whether you're believing in the universe or you call the universe God, um, you know, however you relate to the world that we live in. And for me, that core has always been my spirituality. Mm-hmm. And um, there's been many factors. I speak quite a lot about my great, great, great grandmother um, who, you know, I knew my, I knew her sister who passed away when she was in her nineties. Um, and I speak a lot about Nkunuman Tabisi for, for several reasons. She's named after, and she, and she would tell me, she's named after a warrior queen of the Basotho who was called Nkunuman Tabisi. And from my understanding of this history, Nkunuman Tabisi was an anomaly as a warrior. Um, and they are like, oh, she had, she was surrounded by these women. She did not really listen to any of these men. They were not happy about it. That seemed powerful to me. And my great, great grand would then talk about how people like me have always existed. Mm. You know, somebody wrote, are your ancestors happy with your homosexuality? Sweetheart, my ancestors are homosexual. Yes. Yes, but you would not have children. We would not be here. We make babies too. Mm-hmm. So my joy is rooted in my knowledge and understanding that I am not wrong to exist. Mm-hmm. That in fact, my, my existence is, is very right. It's very preordained. It's my existence because we're all different. We all exist on different spectrums of being. We should not all be the same. <laughs> And so my existence is not wrong. So there's my my ancestors and God, who is apparently a cisgendered, able-bodied, heterosexual white man. I am sorry, I can never believe that shit. The God that I know, that God is not some reflection of some white man. Hmm. I really believe that the white man created God in his image and then is feeding us that bullshit for us to then kowtow in order to serve him. Hmm. Growing up the way that I did, yes, we are God-fearing, but the God that we speak of is a God of love, not a God of jealousy and hate. That's human. That's a human trait. That has nothing to do with God our maker. And so my spirituality roots me in my joy. Um, I don't know if I can advise other people or be a believer. (laughs) We have to find our own joy within ourselves. But for me, really, it began with an understanding that I am not wrong to exist. Mm -hmm. I've been put here to exist, to, to be happy and to share myself and you know who I am with others. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's it for me. Yeah. That's my belief. You know, and, so that's where I find, and that's I think that then transcends to to all that I do, even at my most miserable. And I'm not saying I don't get miserable. Oh my God, my depression. I've had all kinds of like therapists in my life. I've been through. If you know, I'm you know 52 almost black lesbian who grew up in a township and is living in Johannesburg where one is constantly under all kinds of threats. You know, we live though, we go out, we find safe spaces, we find community and we find safety within our communities. And and that's how we find joy. And so as an artist, I do my best to make sure that that translates so that other young people are also seeing that joy is possible. I'm married to a beautiful woman, we're happy. That joy, is possible. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for this. Um, I I do want to um, have other people be able to ask questions. Um, and I'm just gonna briefly 
look at the chat and I see that there has been um, questions coming in. Some of them have been answered already. And then there's one from um, Pierre Brar. I'm just going to read it out. Hi, Bev. Good to see you. I personally agree with you that we all should get involved in teaching, engaging, challenging. But I'm also mindful about race work, that there is this idea that white people must do their own work rather than expecting a black person to educate them. I agree with this, by the way. But how does this gel with the idea that as we that we as queer people should educate cis head people. Thanks, Pierre. You know, listen. <laughs> <laughs> I think as a very race, one, one has to weigh up the different intersections. Um, Racist people know that they're racist. They don't need to be educated otherwise. They think they're superior. They think that people are inferior. That's what they believe. And you can try and unbelieve them or you can walk away and focus on your people. I'm very Biko conscious in that way. Um, I very much love how Biko was like, stop trying to engage them, engage self. Undo the negatives that they have put in your minds about who you are. And that's how I've approached pretty much everything from that point of view, you know, including my queerness. Um, the example that I was giving with Uganda, that's a very clear example of people having pure misinformation being educated to hate, mm -hmm. but it's pure misinformation. Like literally very little of what these people say is their reason for their hatred of homosexuality is based on truth. Yeah. And our lives depend on undoing that. I feel like that's a very big difference to, to, to racism. Racists know that we are human beings. They just help them in making sure that they remain superior. And, and that's just an opinion that obviously we can, we can, you know, power, power where power sits, and we can quote all kinds of intellectuals on power and talk about power relations and power dynamics. But ultimately where there is misinformation that needs to be corrected, particularly when our lives depend. That, that is my take. Thank you, Pierre. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe there is a certain responsibility that lies with allies in this, um, in, in either case, um, and in the intersections of all of this. Um, yeah. Um, then we have a question. Um, sorry, I'm just, um, okay. Um, then there's a question from somebody um, called ZR. Um, really great conversation. Thank you, Marilyn Beth. Uh, my question is on joy and um, how we as queer women can preserve, document, and share joy amidst the constant crucifixion of our intersecting identities. So this goes a bit to my last question to you, but maybe there's something you wanna, you would wanna add or. Um, I, you know, we are here, we're queer, we are on social media, we are in different types of media. Um, we just continue to do that. Um, I bring myself, my full self, to every environment I find myself in. Um, even when I'm most depressed, I'll still bring my full self to a place. Um, and that for me is also bringing my goodness into a space. Um, we continue to do that. That on its own is its own education, I think, um, just by being present in, in every situation. Um, and what I mean, I'm not saying we're walking around saying, hello, everybody, look at me, I'm a lesbian. Um, 
I just mean just I, I try to, to be me and I appreciate other people being themselves in spaces as long as they're safe. Um, that's how you bring joy by bringing your full unapologetic self. It's, it's the, I think the key is the unapologetic bit. Yeah, I wonder, um, I'll, I'll get to the next question in a minute, but I, I wonder, um, I mean, this has a lot to do with um, mental and physical well-being and health and um, self-care. And um, there's this obviously famous um, quote by Audre Lorde about how self-care is actually an active, an, an active, active. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah. And um, I wonder if like how this relates to this. Um, completely and totally when you're constantly told that you should hate yourself because God hates you. There's nothing as damaging as being told that your maker hates you. And as a result, not only does, if God hates you, then everybody else around you surely must hate you. How do you then bring self-love? How do you then reach self-care? Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to have self-love to, to even get to a point of understanding what self-care is. And so there's a lot of undoing. We, we undo, we have to undo. We in undoing all these messages we're hearing around us. We are undoing all these stereotypes that we are hearing around us and seeing around us. We undo, that's the work. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, a book that came out Sia, um, last year, was it last year, two years ago, who wrote the book, You Must Be Gay to Know God. I thought that was such a brilliant title. Yes. Oh, and then, of course, I would sometimes, I mean, I've read it, but I would sometimes take it on the plane with me. And be like, <laughs> you know, and like there'd be all these different looks because like people are reading that title and some would want to engage me and go, what do you mean? And what does that mean? And it's like, you take your life for granted. We have to constantly question our very existence and try to find some semblance of normalcy and joy in the midst of all the yuckiness that we get told about ourselves. And eventually when you reach God within yourself, then none of it matters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that. Um... There's one more question um, from somebody called Surprise Nijoshvi. I'm hoping, sorry, that's probably not how your name is pronounced. Um, thanks for the session. My question is, does doctor think that the African cultural beliefs that holds a female body to a certain level plays a role in the erasure of lesbian bodies? And what can the queer community do to eradicate this? Patriarchy is at the center of most of, of most of our oppression. Um, pat patriarchy is at the heart of the erasure and the subjugation of all femininity, whether femininity coming from gay men or cishet women or trans women or you know, even our trans men who sometimes feel they need to be so much more masculine and kill their femininity, all of that. Um, my feminism is rooted in an understanding that we need to end patriarchy as a system. Yes, we are now beyond the begging for equality. We are now far beyond talking equity. We are way past all of that. Um, some would say, oh, this is the new wave. I think it's always kind of been the wave. We're just articulating it now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with masculinity until masculinity tries to oppress femininity because they both equally exist as balance in all of us as individuals and in the world. And right now, the level of um, toxic masculinity is killing the world. Mm -hmm. My feminism is rooted in wanting to end the system of oppression. 
And so, yeah, we need to be conscious. You know, I, I, I hang around with quite a few, I've got quite a few gay male friends and once in a while I have to call out their voice. Because sometimes we forget that gay men are men. How are we ending patriarchy if you are perpetuating the patriarchy? All of us, those who are not aware that that's what we're doing, we need to be aware and then we can begin to move forward. Because it's not like everybody is aware that, oh, I'm perpetuating patriarchy and misogyny. You know, sometimes people just need to be made aware that that's what you're doing. I, I, I have a friend who was applauding a misogynist incel. He's a gay man. And he's saying, oh, that is such a great, I'm like, no, bro. When you do that, you're reversing what we, I mean, you're a gay man. You know that this man is a homophobe. How are you even applauding him? You know, sometimes people are not aware. And so, so that's that, I think that's what we do is we, we bring awareness when we are aware that something is happening that shouldn't be. That's what we do. We educate. And allies, oh my God, the most important people in our whole being are the allies. Stop laughing with the homophobes. Say something, speak out loud. Be an ally. I don't mean speak on my behalf. I can speak for myself. But when you're hearing it and you're seeing it, be a real ally and say something. Otherwise, you know. You know? And, you know, the, the editor that I was talking about, that's an ally now. He doesn't even entertain the conversation. He says, you don't know what you're talking about. Shut the fuck up. That's, a, that's what we do. We stand up. We speak. We stand up. The African, what you call this African culture and tradition. Also, please, can we engage ourselves a little bit more in, in some kind of critical thinking about what we actually call this tradition and culture? Can we engage it just a little bit and try and discern which part of it came with a boat? Mm -hmm. Can we discern that? Because men wear pants, women wear skirts, came off a boat. What you are calling now tradition and culture that came off a boat. There's a lot that has come off a boat. People saying, oh, before colonization, we were X. How do you know that we were not Y? We are not the ones telling our stories. They are. We've always been here. They came in and said, you are heathens, you're barbaric, you're animals, and then dehumanized us in every single sense of the word, including our sexualities and our gender expressions, of which there have always been many. So we need to engage and question that. Yeah. And I mean, these... I think, yeah, what you're talking about are these systems that are so deeply rooted in, in us um, and that we have to unlearn and undo on so many levels. Um, and so it's the individual, but it's the, um, as a woman, I can be sexist um, because it's the system, right? As a lesbian, I can even be um homophobic um who are now it's like wait 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 you are okay yeah. for one section of the population to be oppressed and you are not a, what when did ooh. yes from what i understand also that's happening around the world is that for the first time the, some of the most powerful people financially, people who have sway um, economically, literary, in all kinds of circles and in industries are now white lesbians. And for the, it's the first time that you have JK Rowling's and all their ilk having the power. Some of the most, what do they say? They say they are silenced 
that's probably the loudest silence I've ever seen in my whole damn life. Yep. Yeah. Um, and now we are also kowtowing to that. I don't, I don't get it. I, I, I don't understand how we can separate ourselves and say, oh, we are fighting for our rights and you don't have a right to exist. Um, and that's also what's, what's happening. There's so much we need to be questioning. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's sometimes even, I think even stating that, I mean, create, um, acknowledging the own identity as a lesbian is sometimes you, you always want to say, but I, of course this includes trans women, but you, then I'm like, why would I need to say that? <laughs> it's just so, um, yeah. But now we have to, to some extent, because there's so many yeah. uh, who are doing this and yeah, getting it all wrong um, and perpetuating this, um, again, a patriarchal and I mean, also a white supremacist system. Um, so they work together quite well. But it's, transphobia is deeply patriarchal. Yeah. yeah. The binary is bullshit. We know this. Yeah. Um, we have uh, one more question coming in and then we're, I think, coming to the end. I'm like losing track of time and space because um, <laughs> we could just speak to you for hours. But um, I will, um, I want to read out this um, this question. I think we have a few more minutes maybe. Or not maybe. Even. A few people were able to comment on the chat box and we did promise to at least acknowledge those. Um, so even if Bev can just cast her eyes while you're reading the next question, I think we had about four people that were sharing their questions in the chat box and not in the Q&A, please. Mm -hmm. um, yes, thank you. I think there's one thing, um, stereotypes such as African-Americans are lazy and everyone else are hard workers. There's interdependent media um, question. I'm not sure I understand it. Um, from PA, I've been reading it over and over again, trying to kind of understand what you mean. Um, yes, we, we do take a lot of our media from the West um, and we do regurgitate quite a lot that we hear from out there. Um, but at the same time, we do have our own points of views that again, we are sometimes not able to share. Um, and sometimes we're not able to share and sometimes we're not able to, to you know, do the, in the interdependence that I think you speak of um, PA. Um, just simply because we are, we are not in charge of all the different spaces and media that we would like. I know someone who wrote a brilliant script about a 14th century trans person. Um, who everyone kind of, they thought is intersex and this person was a, a healer. Um, I've heard these stories before about, you know, way back in the past, healers were always the ones who were gender ambiguous, mm -hmm. um, you know, because God is not a gender, right? Um, or a race. Anyway, um, the script is brilliant. The script is brilliant. Um, nobody wants to touch it. And it's rooted in African mythologies. Okay. You know, I mean, we have healers who are men, who are cishet, who are called Gog. You know, and the women who are called Mkul. There's an understanding of that. So when a healer says this homosexuality is foreign, those kinds of stories are not easy to tell because you need financiers and funders and broadcasters who will buy it and they want to buy the status quo. I don't think I'm answering you, but that's what I'm taking from, from, your, um, from your comment. Yeah, and thanks for underlining this because um, this is such an important point. I think that gets forgotten quite a bit um, because of, yeah white supremacy and also the narratives that we create and that we reproduce. Um, um, so um, surprise is um, saying again, thank you doctor for touching on that. Sorry, I'm not sure. This was a few minutes ago. So sometimes it's a bit difficult to relate. Um, and they're saying, I have been reading a lot on this lately and I realized that our Africanness was never built on binary gender identities. And we're stuck upholding colonizers' beliefs, and majority of people don't know this. 
So yes, the educational aspect is really required to a great deal. At the end of the day, we all have some teaching today. Yeah, yeah I mean, perfectly so, tying into what you just said. And somebody also mentioned biphobia. Again, you know, we are we are we we are we are being dictated to and yes, biophobia is is a thing <laughs> um, across everybody, whether you're queer on this side or you cis hat, uh, you know, biophobia is a thing. And I'm I'm so happy we are at a day and age where people are poly and people are pan. And people are just loving people. Not as genders, but as people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Gaita, for pointing to, um, to that as well. Um, in uh, last year's Pretoria Marble um, conversations, we had um, the first session. Uh, which was on queering coming out, um, nuances among queer individuals in South Africa. And um, um, Zuziwa was speaking particularly about um, bisexual persons there. Um, so maybe maybe you could check, um, check out the session and see if this would be interesting as well. Um, but thank you for, for pointing that out, absolutely. Um, Okay, and I think um, the the person that answer that asked the question earlier um, says that you actually have um, answered this um, the question. So perfect. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I I don't see any more questions, um, and I'm trying to be mindful of the time of everybody, um, and specifically of you. Um, and so I think we are coming to an end for today. Unfortunately, um, but it has been such a pleasure and absolutely amazing. And I, yeah, um, I'm going to rewatch this probably just to soak up more of your joy and, and everything you bring to the world. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to hand over to Naledi for a second um, to introduce us um, to the next session. Um, of the um, Pretoria Marble Queer Conversations. Um, also, please do check out the lecture series at the University of Marburg. We have amazing scholars there, a colleague from South Africa, B. Kaminga, speaking about their new book. Um, so this could be, some of them are in German, unfortunately, um, uh, and a lot are in English and streamed. Um, so please uh, sort of stay tuned. Um, Again, thank you so, so much, Dr. Beth, um, for everything you um, Mariel, can I just quick, quick plug? I'm working on a book with um, Prof. Sharid Shara uh, from University of Berkeley that's going to come out sometime early next year, while I'm also working on the film on my superstar mom, who, as another Black woman, has been erased um, from... South Africa's entertainment history. So it will be coming up soon. So please look out for it. So the book is called Beverly Ditz's Fearless Speech. Um, mm -hmm. And mom's film is Eadlet, um, Superstar Raised. Look out for that, please. Yay. Thank, Thank you for the pleasure. <laughs> Thank you so much for this. Um, yeah, we will, for sure. Indeed. Um, and thank you again, Dr. Bev. I think we all experienced the joy of today. Um, and I think, Mariel, thank you for just uh, facilitating the conversation in such a beautiful way. And I hope we can carry the same energy. It's a tough act to follow. Um, but the next session will be taking place um, next month on the 25th of May, same time at six o'clock. And our speakers are going to be Kanye Sile Phillips. And Rihanna Olafsa, can you see is the Education and Advocacy Officer at GDX. And um, Rihanna is a African philosophy, education, decolonization, and feminist scholar. She's the director or acting director um, of Fort His uh, GBV unit. We look forward to them unpacking the topic, hate speech, targeting LGBTQI plus persons 
Um, and as some people may know, the 25th of May is a reminder on the day um, of the day in when George Floyd was murdered by the police officer, Derek Chauvin. So I think it's going to be an interesting conversation, definitely flowing from the intersectional um, and very intentional conversation we had with Dr. Bev today. And we hope everyone will join and everyone will bring a plus one for free. I think we'll give you free snacks in terms of reactions in our chat box. But thank you again so much and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Who's left? I'm here. <laughs> <laughs>